Good morning, I'm Edmund Phelps. Uh, it's been a joy and an honor to have Philip Howard in the Center on Capitalism and Society while keeping his role fully in common good. And we're delighted that he chose to embed um, this most recent conference of his uh, right here in the Center on Capitalism and Society. Um, I know we all want to get an early start, so without further ado, I pass the microphone to Philip Howard. Uh, thanks, Ned, and thank so all of you for coming. Um, we uh, have a remarkable group of panelists showing up, some live, some, uh, some virtually, and uh, a fantastically interesting audience. Uh, just before I get going, I want to thank the staff of the Center for Capitalism Society for organizing this, Lizzie Feidelson, and also Common Good, Andy Park, and Ruth Giver in particular. Um, I thought what I would do is uh, give a uh, eight or ten minute summary of the hypothesis for this forum, uh, and then we're going to hear for the morning uh, people from different disciplines talking about their take on what's happened in, in modern government. Uh, there'll be two panels of experts and then a third sum up panel with the moderators and myself and maybe someone else, uh, both fielding questions and comments from the audience and, uh, and, and giving their own reflections on this. This is intended to be an opening salvo and our goal is to uh, ultimately is to change the narrative for the 2020 election so that includes uh, a focus on the functioning of government as well as the goals of, of government. Uh, when we read the newspapers, we read about proposals for the Green New Deal or the wisdom of the wall and such, and there are certainly many overdue reforms, but the threshold question not discussed is why government seems to have such a hard time acting sensibly. The poster child for this was the $800 billion stimulus that President Obama got from Congress in 2009 much of which was to be spent on infrastructure. After five years, a report came out saying that barely 3% of it had been spent on transportation infrastructure. And the reason for that, as Obama noted, was that there's no such thing as a shovel-ready project, i.e., the President of the United States didn't have the authority to give the permits to spend the money to fix what everybody knew needed to be fixed. So the goal today is to question the basis on which we've organized modern government. And my hypothesis, which I've argued in a paper that's outside and also uh, more fully in a new book called Try Common Sense, is that we can't repair this system, that we actually have to replace it. We can't repair it because it's impenetrably dense and doesn't let humans make the choices needed to get anything done. One of its side effects is it makes uh, people on the ground also feel suffocated, one of the reasons I think that they voted f for, for Donald Trump. Now, the idea of this governing system is that the proper way to advance public goals is to tell people how to do things, do things correctly, that regulation would be precise and uniform like an assembly line, uh, public choices must be objectively correct, either by complying with a detailed rule or with objective proof. And the reason we have this system, uh, it's, it's a relatively new framework, it only began after the 1960s, is grounded in distrust, specifically the distrust of humans and human judgment and values. And coming out of the 1960s, this distrust was fully warranted, racism, pollution, uh, lies about Vietnam, Watergate, etc. cetera. Uh, and the whole idea we would have this sort of modern system of government where we would avoid bad values by eliminating values altogether. The problem is it doesn't work well. It's a form of central planning. It's certainly not what the framers had in mind when they created a system of principles that allocated um, 
responsibility to different branches to make choices and the other branches to, to check and balance them. The whole idea of the Constitution was to give the different uh, officials and branches the power to make decisions and then the others to, to hold them accountable. This new framework that we invented after the 60s has grown really in a way that no one intended. No one really designed it. It's now about 150 million words of binding federal law and regulation. It far exceeds the capacity of humans to understand it. Um, even companies with large, with thousands of lawyers like J.P. Morgan, you know, constantly running afoul of it. They can't comply with it. Daily life has become a kind of minefield. Teachers are told never to put an arm around a crying child. Bad joke can get you fired. Doctors and nurses spend half the day filling out forms that no one reads. And people, Americans have now been trained to go through the day asking themselves, can I prove what I'm about to do is legally correct? And it's suffocating to people. Again, I think that's one of the incentives for people to vote for why some people voted for Donald Trump. Now, for decades, the, the public debate, and this continues, has been um, to draw the line between basically pro-regulators and, 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 and deregulators. The deregulators have lost. Uh, the last four Republican administrations have all promised to deregulate and government's only gotten larger. The reason for this is probably because Americans want clean air and Medicare and such. So I think they've been arguing about it in, in, in the wrong dimension. Uh, it's really not what government does as much as how it does it, and that is not allowing people to make sense of their own daily choices. I've written a paper for the forum. It's available somewhere in the back. But in the paper, I look at uh, modern bureaucracy through the lenses of three disciplines. And in each case, the structure of modern government is, is indefensible. It violates the basic truths of what everyone agrees are the, are the premises of those disciplines. So in economics, for example, the system doesn't leave room for people to adapt. It makes trial and error basically illegal. It doesn't honor trade-offs of time or limited resources or such. Often you can solve a problem, you can solve 90% of a problem with 10% of the cost. That's how criminal law works and contract law works. They don't try to achieve a kind of a perfect uniformity where every contract goes forward and there's never a dispute over it. We can't eliminate crime with criminal law, and yet we do our best to achieve with a set of laws and principles and enforcement mechanisms enforcement that people generally trust interacting in a free society. But regulation doesn't work that way. It wants it to be perfect. And so it squanders a huge amount of money. Uh, under, in psychology, and this is something I learned more of, actually, I, after I wrote my recent book, I, I found some material by a professor named John Sweller at the in, his teams at the University of New South Wales, it turns out that external, um, complicated external criteria like um, checklists, for example, or bureaucratic rules actually use up what's known as your working memory. So, and, and that's the, the, the conscious part of your brain. It actually has limited capacity to deal with, with very many ideas at the same time. And if you have too many external criteria, bureaucratic rules, it makes it uh, very difficult or impossible to draw on your long-term memory, which is the experience and the things where the genius of humans is. So the effect of giving people too many rules is it makes them stupid. It actually makes people not be able, all the stories you read about in Kafka and Dickens and such, it's not that people are trying to be mean, it's just that they can't even access their empathy. So we've created this system that's actually anti-human. And it's anti-human just by, you can evaluate it by looking at the cognitive sciences. And then also, we, um, I look at it through the, through the viewpoint of rule of law theory. You know, law supports a free society by drawing outer boundaries. Uh, you can't steal, you have to comply with your contracts, you can't pollute, 
And then in between those boundaries, you're free. And law supports freedom because by protecting against those things, people don't have to be defensive during the day. They can move forward without fearful that the water they're about to drink is adulterated in some way. Bureaucracy also tries to avoid bad things, like, like you know, sort of adulterated food or such. But it does this by replacing our freedom. Not by walls, but by bringing these tentacles in and telling you all day long how exactly you have to do something correctly. So it, it sort of protects the egg by killing the goose. So you're no longer free, you're free to do things the way someone wrote a rule years ago, tells you to, to do it. So there's a disjunction, and uh, Jeremy Waldron from NYU Law School is going to be here today to talk about this about sort of the rule of law and, and bureaucracy. Paul Romer, who recently won the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics from NYU, will be here virtually. He's on the West Coast. We had an interesting exchange the other day. He said, you know, Philip, giving officials discretion is a hard sell in the, uh, in the age of Trump. You don't want, you know, Donald and Trump's people to go making uh, decisions where you see it in the newspaper. And I'm sympathetic to that point of view. But my rejoinder to Paul was, the system of law is not about giving people discretion. It's about giving people responsibility. They're almost, they're not, they're not 180 degrees the opposite idea, but almost. Discretion basically implies do whatever you want. Responsibility is an affirmative duty to do something that's defined by law and enforced by other officials. That's our constitutional framework. So what I'm talking about, it's a system where people have to take responsibility, the duty, and are accountable, and it's defined. It's not letting people do whatever they want. And there's this kind of misconception that if you don't have a clear rule, that anybody can do anything they want to do. That's not the way law has ever worked in the history of civilization. If you find any agency or school that works tolerably well, you'll find people who are doing this. They go to work. They don't have their notes in rule books. They're, they're basically uh, telling. They're, they're trying to make sense of their daily choices. So my thesis here is that's it. This emperor has no clothes. We can't repair it. We have to own up to that fact. No leader is going to come make it work better. We have to replace it with a simpler system that honors and empowers human responsibility. The first step is to create a critical mass of thought leaders. Talking about this from their point of view, we have an amazing group of people here today. Uh, the, this session is going to be a little bit staccato. Each person has eight minutes. We're going to be relentless about that, and they can pick up on their discussion uh, afterwards. But uh, we're hoping that we can start a discussion that will expand into the next two years to begin to address the frustrations that Americans have and the failures of our system of government. Thank you all for coming. And now, Mark, you the... Actually, why don't we hold up the um, Right. Um, Mark Whitaker is uh, moderating the bios are in your program, but Mark Whitaker is going to moderate the first panel. Mark uh, is a journalist and author and former editor-in-chief of Newsweek and um, a keen observer of the policy world. Do you want me up here? Or? Uh, as you wish. Actually, do we have enough microphones for yeah, I think so. We actually don't. Okay. So, so we have to pass them around. Yeah. four microphones in the room, so if we can take this one from here, that would be good here. So you want us to speak from uh, here? I see my name. I'm down here. It's up to you. Okay, I'm going to start just so we don't uh, yeah. we keep moving. Um, uh, my name is Mark Whitaker. Uh, I'm a recovering journalist. Uh, I used to be the editor of uh, Newsweek and the managing editor of CNN. And I was in Washington, running the NBC bureau um, for a while. I'm now writing books. Um, uh, my job is to be the moderator, um, which means um, that I'm supposed to ask questions and not give opinions. Um, and uh, I, I gather from Philip to crack the whip to make sure that uh, we stay on time. 
Um, uh, so I'm going to take uh, most of my time here just to introduce the panelists so they don't have to do that themselves and can get right into their remarks. Um, uh, this is a really a, a terrific panel. I'm just honored to, to meet all these folks. Uh, Paul Light um, uh, from the God Goddard Professor of Public Service at NYU Wagner, um, Principal Investigator for the Global Center for Public Service. Um, uh, the great uh, Richard Sennett, um, now at Columbia, and uh, the LSC, who um, told me last night he's going to talk a little bit about Max Weber. I'm looking forward to that. I haven't heard that name since I was in college. Um, Sally Katzen, um, who's now uh, at the uh, NYU School of Law, but for many years was a top administrator at the OMB in Washington. And um, last night I would, uh, we had a little gathering, and I asked her, um, who her favorite OMB director was, and she gave a very diplomatic answer, so I'm hoping she'll be a little less diplomatic in her uh, remarks today. Um, uh, Nicole Goenis, um, a senior fellow uh, at the Manhattan Institute, um, a columnist for New York Post, expert uh, on all things uh, Washington. Is Pat coming or not? Do we know? No, uh, okay. No, all right. Okay. So when do, we don't get to grill him on what's happening with the L train. That's uh, too bad. I'll say whatever I wanted him to say. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll turn over the panel. Um, you know, I'll follow up uh, with some questions, but I guess uh, the one question that I hope we get to uh, by the end of this panel, um, either in the opening remarks or in the discussion afterwards, is to the degree, I don't know how much you all agree with Philip's uh, uh, opening uh, thesis, that things are irreparably broken, but uh, to the degree that you have a diagnosis and maybe even a prescription or a vision of how things could be different, I guess my question would be, how do we get from here to there, wherever your there is? So Paul, do you want to start? Uh, I'm delighted. Um, I should note uh, to begin with that I, you know, I have a PowerPoint, but I'm not going to uh, refer to it, uh, ever was it thus, um, uh, talking about this being a moment for reform. Um, I should say that this is about 30 years to the day that uh, Paul Volcker's National Commission on the Public Service issued its report uh, calling for action uh, to address what we uh, framed out as the quiet crisis. Uh, at the time, we could see markers of uh, decay in administrative systems. Uh, the uh, commission, which I uh, worked for for a brief moment uh, in the wake of an emergency dealing with uh, the deputy director uh, who passed suddenly, um, the commission decided to frame this out uh, as an argument around uh, the need for immediate action on a number of different fronts. Uh, 30 years later, uh, we see that many of the trends that were identified in the report have, of course, worsened, uh, leading us again to say that this crisis is here, it's irreparable, uh, it must be addressed, and the hope is that perhaps in an election run-up that we could bring this to the fore. In my discussion here today, I've identified uh, five, six hazards, actually, that faced the federal bureaucracy and that, that really came to the fore um, in recent weeks with the shutdown. We started to see some things manifest themselves uh, in terms of the discussion about what was going on with the shutdown and its ultimate effects, whether in losses to GDP, uh, problems recruiting the next generation of federal employees, uh, delivery of services and broken um, bureaucracies, the, remarkable slowdown in the appointment of senior officers uh, in this administration, the gaps, and so forth in delivery. So I identify at least six hazards that have manifested themselves and that are pretty serious. Uh, and I would argue, and I, I have argued, uh, off the quiet crisis that the shutdown has really brought that crisis to a roar. We can see it, uh, we can discuss it, and, and let me just run through quickly uh, these six hazards. We've got an aging workforce, and the millennials have been waiting uh, with bated breath for the baby boomers to get out uh, 
and we are seeing it happen. Uh, the last two quarters uh, before the shutdown, we saw a remarkable increase, or a signal at least, a 25 percent increase in the number of retirements in the federal workforce. We're going to see that accelerate. We've been talking about this quiet crisis, the silver tsunami, as some people call it. I, I'm not wild about that uh, description because being silver. Yes, that would be us. Uh, you know, that we're seeing it happen and we know that the baby boomers are going to leave. We don't see similar patterns yet in nonprofit land where we have a large number of grantees who deliver goods and services on the federal government's behalf and we can't tell what's happening within the very large workforce of contractors who deliver services, goods and services on the federal government's behalf, but we do see it in growing skill gaps within the federal government and we know that the baby boomers are going to leave. That's an opportunity uh, for us to reimagine uh, the federal career and to develop new uh, approaches to uh, granting discretion uh, to senior officers in the federal government, we're going to have to address it one way or the other. We've also got aging backbones in governments, the core management systems that drive action. Uh, many of these systems, whether it's in procurement uh, or information management, uh, uh, recruitment personnel, we see deep skill gaps where we uh, uh, are just unable to develop uh, reasonable approaches to managing uh, government activities. We have aging hierarchies. Uh, the federal hierarchy has never had more layers of managers nor more leaders per layer. Uh, we are 71 uh, layers from the bottom of government between the top and bottom of government. I, I know that because I count titles. Mm -hmm. uh, and people will say, well, there can't really be an associate assistant, uh, <laughs> deputy attorney general, can there? Well, Google it. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll find the current occupant. And many of those positions uh, at the very top uh, are currently vacant. And Trump complained uh, at great length of having too many people over people over people, but has done nothing to remove the layers that are now <coughs> empty and therefore policy gets strangled on the way up. We've got agency org uh, uh, aging organizations. Uh, it's been a long time since we lost the reorganization authority that might have let presidents move more quickly to reform government or to rationalize government. Uh, it's been a much longer time uh, since we actually took on government reform. Herbert Hoover was the last uh, leader of a major reform commission. Uh, to deal with this. I'm not saying the answer is another uh, Hoover Commission, uh, but we might think about it. We've also got aging statutes. Many of the core operating statutes in the federal government are now 30, 40, 50 years old. There's nothing wrong with being 40, 30, 40, 50, 60 years uh, old, but we might want to take a look at some of those uh, statutes. Civil Service Reform Act, 1978. Uh, a number of major statutes that regulate procurement and so forth uh, need revision. Uh, finally, we've got aging dividing lines. Uh, we have a very large blended workforce in the federal government, contractors, grantees, and civil servants. We often talk about the civil service as if it resides in a vacuum, but we've now stitched together a workforce uh, that is quite complicated, imperative in many ways, uh, imperative use of contractors and grantees to get the jobs done, but we need to sort things out. The Obama administration made a very aggressive effort to define some key terms in this debate, uh, but uh, we didn't get very far with it in the final analysis. I argue that these trends are coming together uh, and can now uh, be seen as a source of increasing public uh, demand for very major government reform, uh, very major being a term that we use in our surveys of public opinion uh, about the need for government uh, reform. Uh, this country may be deeply divided between red and blue on many issues, but right now about 65 percent of Americans agree that the federal government needs very major reform. They're not necessarily in agreement on what that reform should be, other than getting rid of the other party, mm. removing it from power. Uh, 
But we now see that uh, Americans have come to agreement. Thanks for those extra seconds. I really appreciate it. Inside humor here. Um, at any oh rate, uh, we Listen. see uh, that uh, Americans are demanding reform. And I can uh, uh, broadly predict that the next election will involve a toe-to-toe -to -toe battle between Donald Trump and his dismantlers who want less government, smaller government, and very major reform, and the rebuilders who do not yet have a candidate uh, who want bigger government, more services, and very major reform. It's very major reform that may prove important in determining who gets the presidency in 2020. And that's five seconds ahead of deadline. Excellent. <laughs> there you go. That's Richard. a high standard. Yeah. So, yeah. It's impossible to meet. There you go. Richard, you're next. Shot. Sir, uh, Senate. Well, I want to say Philip's book is remarkable. Um, and uh, I uh, say that again. Yes, I know, but it is. We should do it in a chorus. Uh, yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about one uh, uh, aspect of it that I, uh, in working for the UN, have um, uh, experienced personally, and that is a kind of bureaucratic style of communication which has been variously described as bilge or bullshit. <laughs> and I want to sort of just share with you a few thoughts about how uh, uh, this kind of bilge uh, arises. For me, it's very concrete in the term sustainability goals, which supposedly orient what, orientate what the UN is, is about, but nobody knows what they mean. And there's a, a, a history buried to this. When Max Weber wrote about bureaucracy, he thought that all bureaucracy was going to be modeled on military commands. That is, the more you move down the chain of command, the simpler and clearer all the communications would be. If any of you served in the military, you know that there are rules about polishing your belt buckle, about polishing your shoes, and so on. And to Weber, this seemed, this, this was bureaucracy, that uh, clarity and hierarchy are inseparable. It made a lot of sense to him because he looked at civil bureaucracies uh, uh, like factories as modeled on, on military, where there's a division of labor, gets simpler and simpler the farther down you go. About 50 years after uh, Weber wrote this, here, uh, in Colombia, there was a great uh, kind of revolt against this on the, uh, on the part of Robert K. Merton, our most famous sociologist, and a visitor here named Michel Crozier, who wrote a book called uh, The Bureaucratic Phenomenon. And their notion was that this pyramidal hierarchy of commands gets disturbed by the fact that people who have power want to assert it arbitrarily so that they'll, they'll say, I don't care what the rules are. Uh, I've got power over you because I can contravene these. I can mess them up. It's kind of Trump idea, you know, uh, that you assert your power by creating kind of what's, uh, the rule is what I say the rule is. And for Merton and Cozier, this was a kind of systematic disturbance <laughs> that big institutions, big bureaucracies, had more and more of these kinds of arbitrary assertions of power in terms of saying, what I want is the rule. And that this conflicted with the natural tendency to, um, uh, to decentralize and clarify rules according to the, uh, this military logic of make it clearer, the simpler, uh, the, the less powerful the person you have to deal with. Um, now, another 50 years later, after uh, Merton and Cozier, we have a kind of different uh, attitude towards, or a different understanding 
of bureaucratic bilge. And it is that there is something uh, functional about ambiguity of rules in, in a way uh, from the bottom up uh, that uh, uh, allows people at the top control. There's a famous study of Hewlett Packard, for instance, uh, which is uh, about what does it mean to model uh, Hewlett Packard's, some of its productive uh, 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 products that it makes on 3D printing. The top issues a command saying 3D printing is now the model for all printing. <coughs> That's all it says. <coughs> and below, as this study found, people are trying to say, well, what's that mean? And who gets control of the meaning of defining what, what 3D, you know what 3D printing is. What 3D printing means for a place like us who do two-dimensional two printing. So you get a kind of conflict about who can furnish clarity. And the one who can furnish clarity is the one that gets rewarded by the organization. So the top spawns nebulous rules, and the bottom seeks in a bureaucracy to clarify those rules in order for the bureaucrats who clarify them to be rewarded. That, I'm sorry to say, is the story that I have seen in the UN over 30 years now in the pursuit of something called sustainability goals of the United Nations. Uh, these were promulgated at the top, really in the 90s, uh, based on generalizing somehow uh, issues about climate change and climate sustainability to all aspects of what the UN was, was about. Everything should be sustainable. But that piece of bureaucratic bilge at the top is just like the Hewlett Packard problem, which is, what's it mean? In my bailiwick, in the urban parts of the UN, uh, we have spent 20 years in trying to find ways of defining how cities fit into the sustainability goals. There are 15 of them, and they're all nebulous, that were first defined in the 90s. People spend vast amounts of time trying to say, well, this is how we fit into goal 11, or this is how goal 4, subsection B3, would relate to the work we do. And the people who can do this bureaucratic exercise are the ones who get rewarded in the system, as I've seen, and are promoted. Whereas the ones who want to work the way Philip is talking about, <laughs> loosely, without <laughs> arriving at a difference, who say, look, it's all bullshit, but let's just go ahead and do it. We've got to, you know, buy 40,000 tents for these refugees. Let's not worry about whether it's sustainable or not. Those people do not prosper in the system. So this is, I think, uh, a, it's, a, it's a different kind of phenomenon. And the advent of big data, which means that there are lots of resources to draw on, only makes it only makes it worse. We've got lots of information, but this kind of bureaucratic structure means that the very resources we have to define something only reinforce this. I'll stop. Uh, this problem about bureaucratic bilge, and uh, that's why I find Philip's book so illuminating. We have to get out of this. This is, it's pervasive, certainly in the nonprofit world, and uh, it's self-destructive. So that's the bureaucratic village. Follow up on two <coughs> seconds over. I've taken two of your no, seconds. No, no, you guys are doing great. Sally, go ahead. Uh, I'll try to stick to the time limits. I want to thank you for inviting me uh, to appear with all of these uh, distinguished, prestigious experts in the field. I think I was invited to be the skunk at mm -hmm. the picnic. Um, <laughs> as uh, I, I actually was a bureaucrat 
Uh, in fact, I was at one point in my career the leader of the bureaucrats as the deputy director of management at, at OMB uh, and helped government run. Um, I've read a lot of Philip's work. I think it's very insightful. I agree with some, but not all. Uh, I particularly do not agree with today's premise that the modern bureaucratic state must be replaced, that it cannot be repaired. I do not think that that um, prescription uh, is, uh, is appropriate because I don't agree with the diagnosis. Um, I do not think that bureaucracy has largely, if not totally, restricted our capacity or our will uh, to be creative or innovative and to exercise responsibility as citizens. And I do not think that it is what has led to the malaise, which I think we all experience in the hostility. Uh, my suggestion is rather than replace the bureaucrats, let's get rid of the word. I would uh, suggest that we banish bureaucracy and bureaucrats uh, from our vocabulary. Uh, you're not all very sympathetic to that approach, and it might be more aggressive than what <laughs> needs to be. But I think it would clear the air and allow us to assign responsibility and credit uh, where it fairly belongs. Start with the title for today's program, Bureaucracy Versus Democracy. I'm a lawyer. I always cite cases. There's always a V versus in the middle. It's because the two people on either side are opponents of one another. They're antagonistic to one another. I do not believe that bureaucracy is antagonistic to democracy. I don't think it's hostile. I don't think it's in opposition or at odds with democracy. Now, I will agree that bureaucracy has gotten a bad name. I've often said that bureaucrat bashing is Washington's favorite spectator sport. Everybody engages, and at least since Ronald Reagan, when he said that the problem is not, uh, the solution is not the government, uh, the government is the problem, it has spread like wildfire across the country. Virtually every Republican, office holder or um, office seeker, uh, bashes the government. You saw that with the drain the swamp, swamp with Trump, who wasn't even a Republican at the time uh, in, in sentiment. And to be clear, very few Democrats have a full-throated endorsement uh, of um, uh, the government workers. They may not dump on them, but they rarely extol their virtues, except possibly during the government shutdown. It's one of the few things that was positive out of the government shutdown. People said, oh, that's what the government does. Oh, I like that. Oh, I need that. Oh, this isn't good. It was an awakening uh, of sorts. Uh, and uh, it's, it's most unfortunate that when the drum beats incessantly with one tune all the time, and there's rarely a pushback. It's not surprising that people don't trust uh, the government. Now, who is this bureaucrat that we uh, so malign? Gov uh, dictionary says it's an official in a government department, uh, in a particular, and in particular, one um, who is uh, perceived as being concerned with procedural correctness. Is that so bad? Is that really something that is so offensive? At the federal level, that would include the people who process uh, our social security checks, the people who monitor the weather to issue tornado warnings, the rangers who patrol our national parks, the scientists who work at our national labs, the people who collect census data or other statistical data, the people who inspect our meat processing plants, air traffic controllers. They're all bureaucrats. They're all the people we're going to, what, get rid of? To change their mentality? Do they abide by and apply the laws and the rules of their respective agencies? I sure as hell hope so. Is that grounds for criticism or scorn or derision about how they go about the work? I don't think so. 
So I suspect that notwithstanding the sweeping language, Philip Howard has in mind a more confined, surgical approach, if you will, to, to solving some of these problems. And I think that that's where we should be focused. Not all the same size, not all the same problems. Some people who exercise authority are more rigid than others. In some circumstances, that's wholly appropriate. For example, in evaluating government contracts, you want them to follow the rules. Sometimes it's not appropriate. Sometimes you want a little discretion. This means you have to distinguish. You have to distinguish different types of situations and not paint with a broad brush and say that they're all bad because freelancing, by another name, is not following the law. And the law was put in there for a certain reason. There's a price to be paid when we depart from that. Differential treatment, lack of certainty, lack of accountability, greater inequality, potentially even opens the door for corruption. There's a whole range of things when you say each person should exercise discretion uh, whenever. Uh, let me comment in my remaining one minute mm -hmm. on a solution. And I think, uh, aside from downplaying the evils of bureaucracy, I'd like to see a reinvigorating of education. You know, one of the most unfortunate, unforeseen circumstances um, that fall out from our emphasis on STEM, science, technology, in the schools. The, it was, we, we lost gym, we lost uh, theater, we lost uh, shop, uh, and we lost civics. We have produced several generations now of students who do not know what their government does. Again, I refer back favorably to the shutdown in this sense. As people came to realize what our government does, why should it take a shutdown and the pain inflicted to achieve that? I'm going to yield my last three minutes, three seconds and two. Now I'm out of time. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. That was great. Nicole? Yes, thank you, Mark. Like Philip, I think that much of our bureaucracy has gone awry. But like Sally, I do have a healthy respect for the well-structured bureaucracy that much of government and much of the public depends on. For example, to take Sally's example of the government shutdown, one would not want transportation security agents at the airport to have tremendous discretion over what they'll allow on a plane and what they won't. You wouldn't want a TSA agent to say, well, this person looks like he's qualified to carry a, a gun on the plane and this person doesn't. You want clear rules that are clearly and consistently followed. But to talk about how some of our bureaucratic systems are not serving the purpose they were meant to serve. I will descend from the philosophical examples of Max Weber down to the example of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. And first, I'll, I'll give you a short tutorial, if, if some of you don't know, on how New York City government is supposed to work and how some important aspects of New York City government still work. There, the New York City government was set up so that there is clear political accountability and checks and balances. And it still works this way in transportation, fire department, police department, sanitation, a lot of what government is supposed to do. How does it work? The mayor is elected by the public. The mayor sets broad policies. For example, we want to cut crime without placing an undue burden on minorities with stop, question, and frisk. We want to cut tr traffic fatalities and make more space for bicyclists and pedestrians on the streets. The mayor appoints commissioners to set the strategies and tactics to carry these broad policies <coughs> out. There's, of course, oversight and input from the elected city council in terms of approving the budget and uh, approving some, although not all, of these commissioners. If the mayor is not happy with 
police commissioner, fire commissioner, transportation commissioner, the mayor can ask for that person's resignation and start over with somebody else. So the political accountability there is very clear. But starting in the early 20th century, when the world in New York City got denser and more complicated, government also became denser and more qualified. And a, a good example of this is the exciting world of taxi cabs. Taxi industry has had three existential crises over the 20th century, all roughly 35 years apart. One was in the 1930s during the Depression when too many drivers, people desperate to make a living, were chasing too few taxi customers, people who didn't have money to take a taxi around ta town. And so quality slipped. The drivers were idling in empty cars for below subsistence pay. And then what happened then was the city government, through its existing political accountability structures, dealt with the problem and put in place a regulatory regime that worked reasonably well for another three and a half decades. What did the city do back then? The mayor and the city council put in place a system where a, a taxi driver had to apply for a taxi medallion, purchase a medallion for $10 from the New York City Police Department. Police Department sped, set up a special bureau to enforce basic standards on licensed taxi cabs, licensed taxi drivers, and so forth. And that, again, that worked well. Uh, when did it stop working? It stopped working in the early 1970s. Why is that? Inflation meant that the taxi fare was not worth very much anymore to the taxi driver, the taxi medallion owner. Because they weren't making very much money, the, ta the taxi fleets stopped keeping up the cars. The cars fell into very poor condition. It was hard to attract quality drivers, so people started to say, uh, the drivers, uh, they don't know where they're going. I'd feel unsafe riding in the cab with these people. And then it, another phenomenon cropped up which was what was uh, at the time insensitively called gypsy cabs, where after 35 years of carefully regulating who could drive a cab, enforcement had become lax and people, again, many of them new immigrants desperate to make a living, would just go out, uh, paint a car yellow in some cases, and illegally pick up passengers, particularly in parts of the city that weren't well served by regulated cabs. And so in the outer boroughs, you had illegal cabs going around trawling for fares. And so what did the city do in the early 70s? It didn't take the same approach as it had in the 30s and work with the city council and the mayor to figure out how do we adjust this regulatory regime for these new challenges? Instead, the city created a new bureaucracy, which was the TLC, the Taxi and Limousine Commission. This is a commission made up of nine people appointed by the mayor with the advice of the city council. A person has to be, uh, one commissioner has to come from each borough so the whole city is represented. And the commission was the bureaucratic solution to how will we regulate taxi cabs. It was supposed to have flexibility to deal with all future problems. And the commission's mission is uh, safe, efficient taxi cabs that are sufficiently plentiful. So you think there's lots of leeway for the commission to put in place the right regulations. And indeed, in the 1970s, they did. They licensed the, the gypsy cabs. They uh, put, put in new regulations for this new corner of the market. And they started enforcing conditions of the cabs much better. They increased the fares and so forth. But here you come along 35 years later, and there's a new challenge, which is Uber and Lyft and infusion of another crop of tens of thousands of this sort of new uh, iteration of gypsy cabs on the streets. Taxi and Limousine Commission, in theory, has full discretion to be able to regulate these new car services. Sufficiently plentiful cabs, sufficient is a controlling word. The TLC should have had discretion by itself to put in place caps on Uber and Lyft, to apply congestion pricing regime to these vehicles if it wanted to take that approach to uh, controlling the number of vehicles on the streets. But instead, it became politically paralyzed. It didn't, uh, essentially, although there are many capable people there that do good enforcement, did not do anything significant for 
seven, eight years because the political pressures that used to apply to the city council and the mayor also began to apply to the TLC itself. It had the illusion of independence, but not real independence. And so what had to happen, the city council eventually had to come along after this spate of driver suicides that we've seen over the past 18 months and impose new laws on the TLC, a temporary cap on Uber and Lyft, and new rules that regulate driver pay. State legislature has also come along and imposed a new congestion fee on Uber, Lyft, and existing taxi cabs. So one might ask, why do we have the TLC if it does, if it is not empowered in real life, if not on paper, to make the tough, politically difficult decisions that need to be made every once in a while to regulate the evolving taxi industry. I'll stop there. I had I was going to use the example of the New York City Housing Authority too, but we'll save that for uh, another day or perhaps the discussion session. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll have time and discussion to go into the housing. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm uh, um, trying to channel Pat Foy. Pat Foy is the president of the MTA. He and I have been working on infrastructure projects now for uh, about a decade and trying to streamline infrastructure. He sent me notes uh, and asked me to uh, deliver them as best I can. Um, building infrastructure r requires uh, two things to do it sensibly. It requires a reasonable process, including environmental review and public input, because you don't want people to arbitrarily go in and put highways through parks or, or, or the like. And I'm a big believer in that as a former chair of Manhattan of zoning in Manhattan Community Board 6. And, when I was a young lawyer, I believe uh, deeply in public input. So you want to have a reasonable, fair process, and you also want to be able to manage the contracts sufficiently when you're well when you're building the infrastructure, so you don't waste taxpayer money. You get it done quickly, and you and you, uh, you get it done. What, what's happened, uh, and the problem with bureaucracy, and I think there was an implication that somehow we're trying to restrict bureaucrats is that the people in charge, and Nicole just alluded to this, don't have the authority to make those choices. There is no one in the federal government who has the authority to say, in one situation that Pat was, was involved in and I wrote about, oh, you're just raising the roadway of the bridge using the same foundations. Give me, there's no environmental impact, or virtually none, give me 50 pages of construction impacts. Instead, in that particular case, there was a 20,000 page environmental analysis that took five years to write because no one had the authority to say to the naysayers, no, that's not important. We need to get this bridge done and the environmental impacts are, are obviously minimal because you're just using the same components of, of the bridge. So. So one of the, the problems with modern bureaucracy is that there aren't clear lines of authority that ultimately end up in a, in a democratically elected leader, so democracy doesn't, doesn't um, work. The bureaucracy doesn't work, and democracy doesn't work to hold them accountable. So Pat's points here were that first, government's failing at many fundamental functions, like rebuilding infrastructure well, because no one in the bureaucracy has the authority to make the needed choices. So it's a question, in this case, as in Nicole's case, of bureaucratic em empowerment. Um, his second point is that these failures are not just failures that affect some limited group. It actually affects the entire functioning of the society. In the case of infrastructure, it affects, it, it affects our competitiveness also affects job creation. This third point is that disproportionately harms the poor, is that many of the projects required, uh, in, for example, to fix up public housing, which Nicole is going to continue to talk about in a second, or, or the MTA, are, uh, are subsidized programs where we need to both um, uh, marshal the resources to help people get to work at a, at a reasonable price and such. And if you make it too expensive, or, or then, then you don't end up doing as many projects that would otherwise um, help them. And 
His last point is that there's, um, there's no penalty and no accountability for the extraordinary waste that occurs as a result of these legacy bureaucracies. And by mean legacy bureaucracies, so it's like sediment in the harbor, they kind of build up over decades, and Paul Light was referencing it. Um, you need to be able to make choices when you're building something. There are trade-offs all the time. And what's happened is that these labor rules and bureaucratic rules have piled up so that, for example, with the Second Avenue subway, the cost for tunneling per mile was two and a half billion dollars. It's in Paris, using the same machine, France is a country not known for its efficient labor laws, it cost half a billion dollars per mile. Now, there were some special things about the Second Avenue subway. It was deeper and such. But they had four or five times as many people because of labor rules and bureaucratic constraints manning these machines. Well, that money is coming out of the pockets of taxpayers. It could be used for other purposes. And so, so we're talking about Pat's central point is that it's an incredibly important function of government. And I agree with Sally's list of important functions of government. I'm for government enhances our freedom, incredibly important function of government to rebuild our infrastructure and do so in a sensible way. But that requires giving the people who have the responsibility to do that the authority to make the choices to have procurement is a great example. The procurement codes are completely broken. Uh, you know, you have to, you, you need oversight, but, but giving people, I'll call it responsibility, not discretion, is not only not an invitation to corruption, every study of corruption has concluded that the best way to prevent it is to give identifiable people responsibility to make decisions. It has been to not have dense bureaucracies, not have too many checks and balances so you can't identify who's making decisions, is to be able to put the spotlight on somebody and then you can check their bank account. And so it's really important to give people the responsibility needed to do their job. Pat's been there. He was the executive director of the Port Authority when we first started working together. Now he's president of MTA. And I wish he were here to <laughs> deliver this uh, uh, himself. But he, he would be happy to talk to any of you who want to talk further. It's an incredibly important point in, in getting this infrastructure initiative going for our country. Thanks. So we've got about 15 minutes um, for follow-up. So um, I, uh, realistically, probably uh, two questions. So I'm going to give you the second one first <laughs> so you can think about it, and then I'll give you the first one. So the second one is I would like each of you to respond to something another panelist said. Um, uh, and um, so you can take, take a little time to think about that. While, I, while you answer the first question, which is Philip in his book, um, uh, cites as a kind of model of someone who was able to sort of cut through um, the bureaucracy of the time, um, Winston Churchill. Um, and obviously that was in a time of war uh, when his predecessors uh, had failed miserably. Um, uh, so a unique historical circumstance, but I think one where we can all agree um, that he was able to sort of come in and get things done that nobody else had gotten done and arguably to save the world in the process. Uh, I'm, I'm curious where each of you, you know, has identified a specific problem. Paul talked about decaying systems, which is a problem but also an opportunity. You talked about the, bill, the bill, bull, bureaucratic bullshit and communications. Sally, you talked about taking more of a, a, a kind of surgical approach. Nicole talked about the way in which politics sort of gets in the way of all of these things. Do you have models yourself, both in terms of current politicians or people in history, who you look at and you kind of say they dealt with the problem that you identified successfully? Paul, do you have any yeah, thoughts on that? Uh, or, I, Nicole, you want to start? Oh, I'm sorry. I no, 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 go ahead. You can do it in any order. I would start with Jeanette Sadakan, who was the Bloomberg era transportation commissioner. That if you think about pedestrianizing key parts of Manhattan and the outer boroughs, 
The city has been thinking about doing these things for 50 years, 40 years when Jeanette was there. I mean, the Lindsay administration tried to put a pedestrian mall on Madison Avenue and Fifth Avenue in the early 1970s. And they just got stuck in this bureaucratic morass. The business owners didn't want it. They were sued. The police didn't like it. And they just sort of gave up. And it was kind of an emblem of the multiple failures of New York City during the 1970s. And here, 30, 40 years later, Jeanette comes along, does something that many people would consider impossible in taking away Broadway from Times Square down to Madison Square from cars and trucks. If you tried to get everyone to agree to this, all the business owners, all the hotels, the drivers, the uh, you know people for and against, the community boards and so forth, you would never be able to do it. And they were sued over some of these projects. They were sued over the Prospect Park bike lane. People said they should do an environmental rule. But she literally overnight took Times Square, the crossroads of the world, put up fences, cut off the cars, and declared it a pedestrian plaza, and, and did the permanent construction of the plaza over the uh, few years after that. But this was a clear case of, I am going to take accountability for doing this. If it turns into a disaster, I am the person responsible. But in order to do that, she needed backup from the mayor. I don't have a person. I have a process uh, that I would would refer to. Um, one of the allegations is that um, uh, regulations um, uh, should be refocused on the goals, not the management. I agree completely with that. That has been the sine qua non for federal uh, significant regulations uh, since the 80s. Uh, this came about because people were concerned. There's, there's a performance standard and a design standard for those who are not, who have a life. I don't. Uh, a design standard tells you what you have to do. A performance standard says, here's what we want you to get to. You figure out how to get there. It has been the guiding principle in the review of regulations uh, at the federal level for significant regulations that you choose performance standards over design standards. That's a process that came about because of concern. And so you recommend it. It's done. You've succeeded. Congratulations. It's been there, and it's followed. Can it always work? No, because sometimes you have very ingenious people who will take the objective and devise a way that doesn't fulfill it but undercuts it. And so you get people who then want to layer on some sort of um, more micromanagement. But the performance standard rather than design standard came about through this process of, of learning what needs to be done to be responsive. I can't speak to the state level or the city level, and I can't even guarantee you that it is consistently applied throughout the federal level. But it is a principle that we subscribe to and that there's always a pushback when an agency goes to, that was my office's job, was to push back. When an agency says, you have to do it this way, we say, why specify the details? Just tell them where you want to end up give them some options to do it. Exactly what Philip Howard has been calling for, and it's done in some places, not all. Richard? That's very, illumin that's very illuminating. Um, I would say in terms of the UN, the two uh, people that I think about who hew to this pre performance rather than design standard was one of the first secretary generals of the UN, uh, Doug Hammarskjöld, um, who wanted to get things done and could formulate directives in a way that enabled people to try and do that. Uh, Dick Holbrook was also somebody when he was at the UN, who, do you know Richard Holbrook? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember him? Who um, had the same kind of uh, mentality. 
my comment to Philip is this, is that I think there's a, a caution that has to be made about empowering people uh, in a bureaucracy, which is something very, um, and I'll explain it to you as simply as I can in terms of something we're involved in today, which is a triage that we are in dealing with uh, displaced people a triage we're trying to make between immigrants and refugees. Uh, in term, and this is a program we have in both Turkey and uh, in Tunisia, uh, that we privilege um, uh, refugees for assistance, transport, all of that, over migrants who are uh, economic. This is a very gray area. And it's done on the ground by um, uh, mostly young uh, office, uh, performance uh, 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 UN workers uh, who are making what are really life and death decisions based on feel, questions, sometimes through uh, two sets of interpreters and so on. What we're finding with that is that there's an, almost the weight of, of, of having that kind of responsibility is really heavy for them. And the high levels of stress, people flip out, they, you know, they break down because too much responsibility has been loaded on them. And, you know, this is not like, you know, whether you get, uh, this is not trivial. But it's at the point of delivery that what you're talking about can be something that is too much. And uh, I'm, what I'm, a project I'm working on is how to give these people making these essentially life and death decisions in the field, how to give them more of, uh, uh, to relieve the weight mm -hmm. of having made that kind of those choices. Uh, it's filled with guilt and I imagine soldiers have the same kind of problem. So this is not, a, it's not a rosy good empowering uh, people in a system. It's something that has a, you know, it has a deep, deep undertow. Taking responsibility for something means you take responsibility into your, and yourself. So I think that's the other side of this. Paul, do you have any? On well, I, I, I would say that um, in terms of people who work these issues, I thought the Obama uh, administration had a pretty good crew of people who cared about uh, these particular uh, questions that we've got here. Jeff Zients, uh, you know, um, had strong opinions and he made clear uh, to Congress, uh, he, he, he pounded away on some of these issues. I'm not going to say much about Sally because it would be obsequious perhaps. I don't know. Um, but it was a good group. Uh, I think what we learned from the Obama team at OMB, I'm not talking about personnel it. management, other <laughs> agencies and so forth, is that it's Congress that uh, doesn't really think deeply about this. I was sitting here saying, uh, who, which member of Congress was it that I could point to? And it's been a while. Um, remember Obama's joke about the salmon, you know, every salmon who swims in uh, salt water is regulated by this, every salmon in fresh water is related by that, uh, or regulated by that. Mm -hmm. Well, salmon are regulated uh, by two different agencies, depending on whether they're swimming in salt water or fresh water. Okay, so it was a good joke, except uh, that he, he didn't know the State of the Union, it would have been uh, rude, uh, that uh, every salmon that swims in any water is named by Congress. And until you figure out a way to uh, organize congressional uh, and, and go through some sort of effort to clarify uh, what Congress is doing, it's been, uh, what, all, uh, since the mid-1970s and the OB Commission, uh, that did a fundamental reorganization of the committee structure, and it's time to do it. And some of this uh, swims down from Capitol Hill. Okay, we have about five minutes left, so I'm not sure everybody's going to have a turn, but is there anybody who just disagrees violently with something somebody else said on the panel? Yes. I 
<laughs> Philip Howard said that regulations want to be perfect. I don't think that's true. And you say that they've wasted gobs of money looking at the costs. That's more true than the former, but you've got to put the other slipper on, which is what are the benefits? Something can cost a lot of money and provide good benefits. You yourself talked about clean air. It's nice to be able to breathe. Breathing is not overrated. It's nice to know that the water you drink is safe and the food is pure. Your workplaces are safe. Those are all benefits. And the benefits clearly justify the costs in any major federal regulation in the last 40 years. So, but then why don't people see that? Well, the costs are usually focused on the regulated entities who squeal like stuck pigs, and the benefits are dispersed among everybody, a much broader group who don't really have a voice in the matter, don't speak to the matter, and we take things for granted. We have, I mean, Sinclair Lewis, and then you have the FDA, um, the Corvair, and now you have NHTSA. Uh, we have pocketed all of that. We have taken all of that safety, cleanliness, purity, and we have put it in our pocket, and we don't say anything about it, and no one speaks about it. Okay, uh, Phil. Um, uh, I've said over and over again. We'll pay for I, the microphone. As I agree <laughs> with, I agree with government's goals, but the proof is in the pudding. And so government does accomplish a lot, albeit often inefficiently, but the inability of any federal official to draw the line on environmental review, an area I am deeply involved in, is a structural matter, as well as, at this point, a cultural matter. People don't want to take responsibility, resulting in dramatic waste and in uh, in increasing cost in infrastructure. Um, there was a, a feature in the New York Times last year about regulation of an apple farm. One of the uh, federal regulations requires that the <laughs> apples uh, be covered, apple cart after the apples have been picked, be covered with a cloth uh, on the way from the orchard to the, um, to the barn to avoid uh, um, bird droppings. The, um, the apples have been growing on a tree for five months. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and completely exposed to birds. And so it's, it's just because government does a lot that's good, which I completely agree with, doesn't mean that it's performing. And also there's an assumption through this, even a little bit in Richard's comment, that there is a correct system and a correct amount of responsibility. That's not what I'm saying. What, what I'm arguing is that everything requires adaptation. Every, the, the, situation, the situation on the ground with refugees and, and, and migrants requires adapting to the incredibly difficult choices being, being made there. Um, focusing on how the apples are covered is completely absurd and it drives those people nuts. So uh, getting permits for new pharmaceuticals shouldn't take 10 years if everybody knows it's going to save a lot of lives. There should be a risk-benefit analysis there. This should be done in two or three years maybe after the phase two trials show what it is. Well, those are the kinds of choices not being made. And, and as every legacy institution, not just government, becomes ossified, they no longer perform their duties. That's happened. Paul Leitz, incredibly hard to read his stuff on this, incredibly important. We're at a point now where we need to make it better just because times have changed. And it's, it's become more ossified while the world has moved forward in another direction. We have to wrap up, but Nicole, did you have something that you can do fast? Yeah, yeah. I was only going to add, you asked why. And I would say a lot of this is unaccountability by design, that de Blasio does not want responsibility for regulating Uber and Lyft. He wants to blame the TLC for this. And if you look at Pat's example, why are there 25 people on a tunnel machine? Because the multi-employer pension funds that the tunnel workers rely on are insolvent. They need 25 new people to pay into the retirees' uh, pension plans. That's not a bureaucratic uh, frivolity or stupidity or failure. It is that way for a reason, and unless you address the reason, 
you won't fix a problem, but because the reason is hard to address, it's easier and more fun to just blame the bureaucrats. Well, I think that's a suitably hard-headed note to end on.